Hello and welcome to this session of Climate Justice and Disaster Law delivered by Professor Rosemary uh, Listo. So my name is Firas Salan and I'm the Faculty Liaison Manager for the University of Sydney Law School. Professor Rosemary Lister is a professor of climate and environmental law at the University of Sydney Law School. And she is also the director of the Australian Centre for Climate and Environmental Law. So a bit of housekeeping issues. As you can see at the bottom of your screen, there is a Q and A uh, functionality. So please use the uh, Q and A box to post any questions that you might have. So uh, towards the end of this session, uh, to around the last 10 to 15 minutes, we will endeavor to respond to all your inquiries. So over to you, Professor, and I hope you enjoy this session with us. Thank you very much, Ferris. And of course, it's my great pleasure to welcome you to this uh, masterclass. My name is Rosemary Lister, and I've been teaching at Sydney Law School um, since 1996, specialising, of course, in environmental law. And when I first began my teaching and my research at Sydney Law School, I was looking largely at questions of energy and climate change. And uh, since about 2010, I've been specialising in the area of climate justice and disaster law. And so I thought that today I would share with you a brief presentation on some of my work. I also want to tell you about the Master of Environmental Law program. Now this program is, was started in 1992. It's one of the longest surviving Masters of Environmental Law programs in Australia. And indeed it's one of the largest in the world. And it's one of the largest both because of the number of staff that we have on faculty, but also because of the number of units that we offer. So every single year we offer between 10 to 12 units, but sitting behind those are other units which we offer every second year. So we have a very wide range of units for students to uh, choose from. And so it really is um, very, exciting for me to be able to introduce you now to my specialist area of research, which is climate justice and disaster law. And of course, I'm very willing to take questions, but also if you wish to email me with your own questions about the program, um, I'm very happy to do that as well. So as, as I mentioned, my specialist area is climate justice and disaster law and i'm just going to give you a brief introduction into this subject area to hopefully stimulate your interest i teach a number of units in the master's program and this is one of mine i also teach another unit um, called energy and water security law and i just want to begin as we always do at the University of Sydney to acknowledge the tradition of custodianship and law of the country on which the University of Sydney campuses stand. We pay our respects to those who have cared and continue to care for country. So just to tell you a little bit about my most recent publications, in 2015, I published a book Climate Justice and Disaster Law with Cambridge University Press. And in writing this book, I established an entirely new area of legal research called climate disaster law. And then on the right, you'll see a research handbook on climate disaster law, which I edited. And in that book, there are chapters from specialists all around the world on climate disaster law. So I want to start by um, talking with you about what are the key climate justice issues that we are facing in the world today. And the first is responsibility for emissions reduction to meet the temperature goal of the Paris Agreement. And that is to keep the rise in global temperatures well below two degrees, 
and preferably to keep that rise at 1.5 degrees above pre-industrial times. Also, responsibility for adaptation and disaster risk reduction at the national level. Responsibility for climate finance, and that means funding developing countries with regard to their efforts to reduce emissions and adapt to climate change. Responsibility for compensation, so how do we compensate the victims of climate disasters? And finally, responsibility for climate displaced persons, because we anticipate that there will be anything between 200 million to 1.2 billion people displaced by climate change. So I want to talk initially about the science of climate change. And the, the panel upon which the international community relies for climate science is the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And this was established in 1998 by the World Meteorological Organization and the United Nations Environment Programme. And essentially it set up three working groups. Working group one that looks at the hardcore scientific aspects, working group two which looks at vulnerability and impacts, and working group three, which looks at the options for limiting greenhouse effects. It meets once a year and it supports the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. Now in 2013, 2014, it brought out its fifth assessment report. It brings out these reports usually every four to six years. And in doing that, it reviews the latest climate science from around the world. And as you can see here in that report, it was reporting on the increase in uh, global surface temperatures. And you can see that those are increasing every single decade. It also is reporting on the right-hand side on the shrinking of summer sea ice. And below that, it's also reporting on the global average changes in terms of the warming of the oceans. So those are some of the fundamental issues that it was reporting on in 2013, 2014. Now with regard to sea ice, uh, this is scientific evidence which shows that more ice melted from the ice sheet on the 1st of August, 2019 than at any other time on the record. The IPCC in that report also spoke about global mean sea level rise. And depending on how well we do on reducing our emissions, which is that purple band, we will see less uh, rise in sea level than if we don't do very well and we continue to go business as usual, which means that we may see up to one meter of sea level rise. The IPCC also talks in that report about the sinks for carbon in the world. So we have sinks in forests and we have sinks um, in the ocean and also in the atmosphere. But above the line, what you see is all of the processes such as deforestation, fossil fuel emissions, etc., cetera, um, which means that as these emissions increase, the Earth is less able to act as a carbon sink for CO2. And very importantly, what the IPCC told us in this report is that a large fraction of anthropogenic climate change is irreversible on a multi-century to millennial timescale. And we're going to see elevated surface temperatures even after a complete cessation of anthropogenic CO2 emissions. Um, ocean warming will also continue for centuries. And depending on the scenarios and how the global community responds and reacts, about 15 to 40% of emitted CO2 will remain in the atmosphere for longer than 1,000 years. Now, also in this report, the IPCC 
looked at the risk of extreme events. And of course, no matter where you are in the world, you will have experienced an extreme event of one sort or another, floods, cyclones, bushfires, and so on. And the IPCC reports in a lot of detail about its expectations of these extreme events in the future. So to give you a bit of an update on climate science, the, um, there have been a lot of papers that have been published by scientists since 2018. This one essentially saying that um, this is the IPCC again in its 2018 report called Global Warming of 1.5 Degrees, that human activities are estimated to have already caused approximately one degree of global warming above pre-industrial levels and that global warming is likely to reach 1.5 degrees C between 2030 and 2052 if it continues to increase at the current rate. And so we really need far reaching and rapid transitions in all of our systems, our energy systems, urban infrastructure and industrial systems. This is a paper published in the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences in 2018 called Hothouse Earth. And essentially what it's saying is that we can anticipate that the uh, global climate will tip over into dangerous systems, for example, in the yellow between one and three degrees of increase in surface temperatures, we will see the Greenland ice, sea, ice sheet melting, the Arctic summer sea ice melting, the West Antarctic ice sheet melting. With three to five degrees, we can see things such as the jet stream, the El Nino Southern Oscillation, et cetera, um, tipping out of control. And then when we go above uh, five degrees, we see, for example, the complete melting of Arctic winter sea ice. Now, this is really important that in on November the 5th, 2019, 11,000 scientists from 150 countries supported um, an article that had been published in Bioscience and these scientists declared a climate emergency saying that scientists have a moral obligation to clearly warn humanity about um, catastrophic threats and to tell it like it is. And so essentially they clearly and unequivocally declared that planet Earth is facing a climate emergency. Now, along with that, an article published uh, in, on the 28th of November in Nature essentially said that more than half of these climate tipping points, which I have already been talking about, are now active and they are happening much earlier than expected. So when we say than expected, you can refer back, for example, to the IPCC reports. And what scientists said in this paper is that this amounts to an existential threat to civilization which requires an emergency response. Then in December um, of 2019, you can see that the World Meteorological Organization is also saying that we have increased global temperatures by one um, degree or more, and that the concentrations of carbon dioxide are higher than they have ever been before. And then the United Nations Environment Program produces this emissions gap report uh, every year, which shows that the global community is not doing enough to reduce emissions. And essentially what it's saying is that in order for us to meet the Paris Agreement target, we need to increase our efforts fivefold and if we're going to meet, um, that's for the 1.5 degree target, and if we're going to meet the two degree target, we have to increase all of our e efforts, which we are currently taking threefold. 
So essentially what I'm letting you know is that these warnings are coming from a variety of sources. And this is an interesting one coming from the World Economic Forum in 2019, which was essentially talking about the risks that it saw, the global risks landscape in 2019. And as you can see on the extreme right hand corner of that graph, you can see that extreme weather events, um, the failure of climate change adaptation and so on, um, is ranked very highly by the World Economic Forum. And if you look at the extreme left of that graph, you'll find that that orange diamond shape is the risk of a complete nuclear disaster. And so the likelihood of nuclear disaster is far less. The likelihood of extreme weather events is far higher. But the economic impacts of these, the World Economic Forum believes is almost equivalent. So that's a, a very sobering diagram from the World Economic Forum. And while we think about the impacts on humans, the economy and so on, obviously we have to think about the impacts on non-human species and ecosystems. And what you can see here, this is a report, a very influential report called the Global Assess Assessment Report on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services. And if you have a look at those direct drivers, you can see that there are many drivers which are impacting on climate change, uh, on biodiversity. The orange band is climate change. And it's really showing some quite concerning um, statistics about the extent to which ecosystems and species and so on have declined and are going extinct. And so they said that um, human actions threaten more species with extinction than ever before. One million species already face extinction within many decades and without um, further action, the global rate of species extinction, which is already at least 10, tens to hundreds of times higher than it has averaged over the past 10 million years, is obviously um, increasing and it's a matter of great concern. Since the rise of human civilization, about 83% of wild mammals have been lost. So this is really the scientific basis and it's also the views of a number of agencies and organizations around the world of the threat of climate change. Now also as part of the fifth assessment report, the IPCC in 2014 brought out its report on impacts adaptation and vulnerability. This is working group two. And this is a very useful diagram because what it shows is that the risk of climate disaster falls at the intersection of three things. The hazards of extreme weather, part of which is natural variability, but which is exacerbated by climate change, vulnerability and exposure. So when we think about that, we can think about people and, and ecosystems that are very vulnerable and which are in harm's way in terms of when the extreme event hits. Now, in this report, the IPCC reports on every continent, and this is just an example of small islands and some of the impacts which we can expect. Um, loss of livelihoods and so on. And this is because of cyclones, the uh, rising sea levels, the warming of the oceans, etc. And the point about this slide is that the cross hatching shows the chance of adaptation doing, being able to do anything about this. And essentially what the IPCC is saying is that there are limits to the extent to which adapting to climate change will actually be able to avert some of the consequences. And 
Now what I want to do is just to give you some appreciation of the extent of climate disasters. And I'm really just going to show you some pictures because I think often, as they say, pictures speak louder than words. So this is um, an image of the Thai floods in 2011. This is looking at Hurricane Sandy in New York and along the eastern seaboard of the United States in 2012. This is looking at Typhoon Haiyan in 2013. This is looking at Cyclone Idai in 2019, which hit the eastern seaboard of Africa, the biggest uh, single disaster ever in that part of the world. We've had our own disasters here in Australia, for example, the Murray Darling Basin fish kill in 2019, of which climate change was one factor. The California bushfires of 2019. And of course, many of you will be aware also of the Australian bushfires of 2019 and 2020. And of course, their, their um, very distressing impacts, not only on humans and human loss of life, but of course, also on the loss of life and suffering of animals that are caught up in these bushfires. Now, the World Bank published this report in 2017 called um, Building the, Re the Resilience of the Poor. And what it did was that it looked at what it was that was pushing people into poverty. And essentially, it said that extreme events um, and climate disasters are pushing millions of people into poverty. And if you have a look at those bar graphs, you'll see that essentially um, the factors which are most responsible are the climatic factors of storms, wind, floods, um, and so on. So the question then is what is the international community doing about it? And the main international law instrument is the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change of 1992. And the goal of this convention is to stabilize greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere so as to prevent dangerous anthropogenic interference with the cli climate system. Now, remember, these words are from 1992 within a time frame that would allow ecosystems to adapt and essentially to ensure that humans and human livelihoods such as food production and so on is not threatened and to enable economic development to proceed in a sustainable manner. Well, I would suggest to you that already we have reached the point, as scientists have already told us, where we have not achieved the stabilization of greenhouse gas um, concentrations to avoid dangerous anthropogenic interference because we are seeing the kinds of effects which I have already um, set out for you. So just to take you obviously very quickly through some of the main developments that have happened under the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. In 1992, when this convention was established, it was largely to do with mitigation, in other words, emissions reductions, because of the fact that there was hope and indeed the intention that emissions would come down substantially. But by 2010, Global leaders who were negotiating under this framework agreed that it was now time to seriously engage in climate change adaptation because there had not been enough work done on emissions reduction. And then in 2013, interestingly, the international community said we have to start preparing for climate disasters. And so they established the Warsaw International Mechanism for loss and damage. And that is looking at how to protect 
least developed countries who are most vulnerable to the impacts of climate change from those impacts. And then another really important moment was the establishment under the Paris Agreement of the Task Force on Climate Displaced Persons. And the reason that that is important is because of the numbers that I've already suggested um, of anywhere between 200 million to 1.2 billion uh, people who, who may be displaced. So what does it mean when the UNFCCC talks about loss and damage? Well, as you can see here, it's rather a nice chart. It looks at a simple chart. I shouldn't say it's a nice chart which looks at the slow onset events of climate change, such as temperature rise, desertification, glacial retreat, and so on. And then also looking at the extreme events that we have been discussing, such as cyclones, um, heat waves, etc. Now, at the bottom of this diagram, you can see a bar graph that looks at economic and non-economic losses. The really important thing to notice here is that when you hear, for example, that Hurricane Sandy caused $75 billion of damage in the United States, that is only looking at the economic losses and to mention that of that $75 billion in loss, only $20 billion was insured. So these disasters are leaving gov governments all around the world with enormous deficits in terms of what is insured and what is not. But also importantly is to draw your attention to the non-economic losses. And these are the losses that individuals suffer with regard to their loss of jobs, their health, their mental health, etc., society, and also the environment. So it's very difficult to work out exactly what figure in terms of dollar terms to put on the loss and damage, but it is very, very extensive. And so this Warsaw International Mechanism basically puts obligations on developing countries to do proper risk assessments of where they stand, what the likely impacts are going to be. And an important part of this mechanism is that the international community itself agreed that climate change adaptation cannot all be reduced by adaptation. And that is why questions of compensation and insurance and climate disaster funds become so important. So I want to take you very briefly now through the Paris Agreement. Uh, in lectures, I would spend about three hours uh, between the years of 1992 to the Paris Agreement in 2015, but I don't have time to do that, but I'm sure that all of you will have heard about the Paris Agreement. So I just want to show you a diagram which sets out, uh, in essence, what the Paris Agreement is all about. And it has long-term goals. And essentially, there's the temperature goal, which, as I've mentioned, is to keep a rise in temperatures well below 2 degrees, preferably 1.5 the adaptation goal that all countries have to engage in adaptation planning. And those are um, obligatory measures under the Paris Agreement. But the third goal, which you can see um, is colored differently, which means that it's not obligatory, is to ensure that finance flows from developed countries to developing countries. And without being able to go into a lot of detail, under the UNFCCC and the various agreements by now, about $1 trillion of funding should have flowed to developing countries, um, but only $10 billion has been pledged. So there's a massive funding deficit to deal with mitigation and adaptation. So that is, those are the goals. What are the actions? Well, to take action on emissions reduction, that's mitigation, to take action on adaptation, and to take action on loss and damage, 
And what the Paris Agreement says is that uh, developing countries will be supported through finance, as I've mentioned, through technology development and transfer. So if developed countries have um, any of the uh, technologies which they have found useful, they should transfer those to developing countries. And also that money will be spent on capacity building in developing countries. Now the procedural aspects are very important. The first is that there's transparency of action. So there are a lot of rules about countries and what they have to report on. And essentially it's reporting on how they are bringing down their emissions and how they are adapting. The global stock take is a very important mechanism which I will talk about on my next slide. And then finally, there are provisions for compliance um, and implementation. Now, I'll just let you know that the compliance mechanisms are regarded as weak mechanisms, legally speaking. Essentially, if countries are found not to be honoring their emissions reduction commitments, there will be a process of exposing them. So it's a sort of naming and shaming process um, in the global community. So this is the global stock take, and this is how it's intended to work. The first stock take was in 2018, where the UNFCCC basically um, released data about where we are and in terms of emissions reduction. And you can look at the UNEP emissions gap report, which I presented to you, which shows that we are way off the Paris goal. And then this stock take happens every five years. So in 2023, there will be another stock take, another in 2028, another in 2033, and ultimately, the goal is to be very close to being carbon neutral across the global economy by 2050. And if you think about it, that is only in 30 years time. And so there is an enormous amount of work to be done um, in those 30 years. So, so much for international law. Uh, if you would like my perspective on what has happened over the years, there has been a concerted effort amongst all countries of the world to keep the negotiations on foot, because there have been many times when the multilateral negotiations have threatened to um, fall over because of sticking points that couldn't be agreed upon. And one of the most recent of those was the Copenhagen negotiations in 2009. And it was anticipated at that time that, in fact, countries of the world might never again gather um, under one umbrella, that umbrella being the UNFCCC. However, fortunately, in my view, countries are still at the negotiating table and the biggest intervention of the Paris Agreement is that it was the first time that developing countries and developed countries both offered up what is known as their nationally determined contribution. So they worked out for themselves exactly what their economies could afford to do, and those were the commitments that they made. Whereas before that, the uh, agreements had been binding only on developed countries and essentially targets were set and countries had to comply with those targets. So it's a very different approach. I am very concerned by all of the reports which I have presented to you and more, which shows that we are way off target in terms of bringing down global emissions. So those negotiations are ongoing and Countries of the world meet every single year at what's called the Conference of the Parties, that's shortened to COP, and the COPs roll on year in and year out. And every year, what happens is that, for example, the Paris Agreement was in 2015, um, 
the rule book for the Paris Agreement was agreed to in 2018, 2019. So these negotiations are continuing and we all hope that ultimately countries of the world will take serious action in terms of bringing down their emissions, dealing with climate change adaptation and also dealing with disaster risk reduction. So that's the international law perspective. And in the last slide, I want to talk to you about domestic climate disaster law, because ultimately the international rules have to be implemented at the level of every single state and national and state and local governments all have to work together to go through these phases. So these are the phases of a climate disaster. The first phase is called prevention. So in other words, we have to mitigate greenhouse gases, we've got to engage in risk assessments, and we've got to do climate adaptation and disaster risk reduction. Phase two is the response phase. And this is what will everyone be doing when the disaster actually strikes. So what we're talking about here is some technical actions, for example, emergency warning systems. And you may be aware of these, that if, um, for example, cyclones are approaching, then there will be emergency warning systems going out. Here in Australia, during the summer bushfires, everyone was encouraged to uh, download an app, and emergency warnings went out on that app telling people to leave now, um, otherwise they might uh, lose their lives. Now, emergency warning systems is the single most important thing that has saved lives in recent decades. Everyone has to have an action plan. Even households have to have an action plan of what to do when disaster strikes. And a very important thing is knowing which level of government is in charge. Is it the federal government? or the state government, what is the role of the military? When can the military be brought out? And these are all legal questions. Now, phase three is when the disaster has passed and everyone has to engage in the recovery and rebuilding process. And here, the mantra is that we should all build back better. In other words, we should build back in ways that actually tries to ensure that the disaster will not have the impacts that it has had before. So if you're going to continue to live in a bushfire prone area, for example, you will be required by local governments to build fire bunkers, etc. And also in the recovery phase, we have to have strategies in place for how to deal with climate displaced persons. And that may mean relocation, and that has to be planned for. Phase four is really a very difficult phase because as I've suggested to you, the, cons the financial and the non-economic losses are very, very extensive. And so we have to look at how we are going to transfer the risk of that loss. And essentially from a legal point of view, we look at, at three mechanisms, tort law, and of course there has been a lot of litigation where communities have been bringing actions against fossil fuel companies and others to try to get satisfaction for their damages they haven't been successful so far but tort law remains an option then there's insurance unfortunately what we find with insurance is that most people are either not insured or underinsured so behavioral economists are doing a lot of work to try to work out why people don't take out insurance, does it need to be subsidized by government and so on. And then um, finally, disaster relief packages, which are established under legislation in virtually every country of the world. And that legislation spells out how people can go about claiming for disaster relief. And so essentially, as you can see, the area of 
climate justice and disaster law is a very complex area because it, it brings in emissions reduction, it brings in climate change adaptation and disaster risk reduction, but it's an international law subject and it also is a domestic law subject because wherever it is in the world that you live, you could do an analysis of how prepared your legal system is for climate disasters by going through these phases, phase one, phase two, phase three, and phase four.